We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 1, and uh, just as an item of review, I'm going to give us a couple of uh, points that we've walked through in this chapter as we wrap it up today. The last few weeks, we've been talking about motivations for holy living, so uh, probably as we left last week, you had some time where you hopefully spent some time with the Lord and asked him what it is that he was calling you to lay aside to live a holy life that he's called you to, and then what it is that he was encouraging you to do more of in order to live a holy life that he's called you to. We talked last week about the motivations and four of them that we covered in the last two weeks. The first one was the primary motivation we have is the blessed hope that we have in Christ, and that motivates us to live holy lives. Secondly, the Word of God. We're going to talk more about the Word of God today, but the Word of God is a huge encouragement and motivation for us to live the way that God's called us to. Thirdly, we talked about the good judgment of God last week. The fact that God is examining our lives to see the things and to uplift and glorify the things that bring praise to his name through our lives. So we think of judgment, I know sometimes it's a hard word we talked about last week, but really the judgment of God can be and should be for Christians a very good thing, a very encouraging thing. And then lastly, the fourth motivation for holy living we talked about was the love of God, the price of our ransom, the great love of God, and we're going to talk about the reflection of his love in our lives as we love each other and love others a little bit more today. I want to open with... A quote that uh, we were, I was just read this morning, actually, and I was talking with some of our uh, staff people with this morning. It's this. It's from Ray Ortland Sr. He says this, half-hearted Christians are the most miserable of people, of all people. They know enough about God to feel guilty, but they have not gone far enough with Christ to be happy. I'll read that for you one more time. Half-hearted Christians are the most miserable people of all. They know enough about God to feel guilty, but they haven't gone far enough with Christ to be happy. God has called us to not be half-hearted Christians, but to live holy lives that are totally immersed in all that he's done for us and who he's made us to be so that we can be joyful in him as we live. The problem with not living the life that God's called you to, but knowing what God has done for you, is you can feel guilty about all that God has done for you, and you'll feel guilty about the way you're living if it's not in line with him and what he's called you to. That's called conviction, and the Holy Spirit wants to move you out of that into right living. That's the motivation that the Holy Spirit wants to take us through. So today as we dig in, let's not do so in a half-hearted way. Let's dig in. Let's, let's see what God has for us, all that he's showing us in his word. And as we do, let's take that content, let's take that truth and apply it to our hearts and lives and let's change and live differently for him. 1 Peter chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 13 down through 25. So it's a little bit longer section, but the verses we do, we're focusing on today, 22 through 25, just build right out of the previous verses. So we're going to start in verse 13, follow along with me if you can in your Bibles. Therefore, verse 13 says, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called us, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And if you call on him whose father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for our sake who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. 
For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower fails, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. May God help us as we look into his word this morning, and particularly that last phrase as we look, I'll jump down to verse 25, the end of it. This word is the good news that was preached to you. This is Peter's focal point. This is what he wants us to understand. The good news of Jesus Christ, which has been brought to us through God sending his son to die the death we couldn't, that we deserved, and to rise again victoriously from the grave, that is the good news that the word of God is based on. Peter's already talked about the fact that not only is it the good news that comes from the life of Christ and forward, but it's the good news that God has always been proclaiming throughout all of history, throughout all of the Old Testament scriptures, all the way back to creation. Right in Genesis 3, we are promised a redeemer. And in that promise, God fulfills everything that we need. So as we look today at these verses in 22 through 25, we take what we looked at last week, this motivation to holy living, and we take holy living, and Peter gives us really how to apply it one way directly right now. And that's through love. Now it's interesting, we'll dig in in a minute here. He uses two different words for love as we go forward, but we'll unpack that in a minute. This idea that we have obeyed the truth. If you look back briefly to verse 14, it says, as obedient children. So this obedience is a mark of a Christian. It's not a popular phrase. We don't like the term obedience. It means that someone else has authority in our lives. But the reality is someone else has authority in our lives, whether we recognize it or not. The creator of all things has authority in all things. The great pursuit of humanity in our flesh is to keep getting out from under that authority. And we ride against it. But God says, if you as obedient children settle yourself in it, you'll find a peace that passes understanding. So we're called obedient children, those who follow Christ in verse 14. And now in verse 22, he uses this word again, obedience. He says, having purified your souls by your obedience. Now, I don't want us to get confused here. Your obedience doesn't. Your works do not purify your souls. Let's be careful with our grammar here. It says, having purified your souls by your obedience to what? That's for all of us. By your obedience to what? The truth, it's not on my face, it's in your Bible. You're going to have to look at it, okay? If you're going to be with me here, all right? (laughs) Having purified by your obedience to the truth. What is that truth? What is he referring to when he says that you've purified your souls by your obedience to the truth? Your obedience to the truth is the good news of the gospel that he's been proclaiming for this entire chapter. That Jesus... His miraculous birth, his sinless life, his saving death, and his victorious resurrection changes everything. And as you obey that truth, your souls are purified. When you come into life in Christ, through his redeeming work, your soul and my soul gets purified through our faith in him. That obedience to truth, okay? We're we're not talking about, remember last week we talked about there's a difference here between our obedience to God's truth and our faith in him and our works that come out of our faith in him and our obedience, right? Our good works, our holy living come out of our new life in Christ that is in faith. But God's redeeming work is the one that purifies our souls. Don't get confused. Because he's assuming at this point that the readers are Christians. They're walking in their faith. They're seeking holiness and right living. So he says, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. That being true, if you have gotten new life in Christ and are walking in him, then follow with me next. For a sincere 
brotherly love. So here is a familial term, right? Brotherly love. We'll unpack it in a minute, but what this reflects to us is that we are in this together. We are in it together. Look around at the people next to you. Take a glance. Go ahead. You can do it. Look at the people next to you and realize that you are in this together. You are in this pursuit of living a holy life with the people sitting next to you. You need them. They need you. It's a family. And as God purchases us, purchases us into his family, he then calls us to be together as his family. Together in God's family is the focus of this particular section. We're going to look at three different reasons and three different explanations of how we are together in God's family that Peter gives us. And the first one is this. We have experienced the same birth. That's kind of self-explanatory, right? When you have experienced the same birth as someone else, you are part of their family. Okay? Brothers and sisters. Just like we experience physical birth, right? You have two parents that give you physical birth. One of the remarkable things about Scripture is this. We also have two influences that give us new birth in Christ. The Spirit of God, John 3, verses 5 and 6 tells us this. John 3, 5 and 6 says, truly, truly, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he's explaining him this idea of being born a second time. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh and that which is born of spirit is spirit. See, to be born again, to have spiritual new life and birth means that you've been born of the Spirit. But also here, we see the second influence in our spiritual birth. John 3 talks to us about the Spirit being primary in that. Read with me a few more verses here. Verse 22 says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, meaning you're in Christ, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Now we'll unpack that in a sec. Just hold on to it. Verse 23, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. You've been born again through the spirit and God's word. So when you start talking about new birth, spiritual birth, just like your physical birth requires two parents, your spiritual birth, God just does this probably just so it makes more sense to us, but he uses two primary influences, the Spirit of God and the Word of God in your life. The Spirit of God brings you into new life. The Word of God instructs you in all things in this new life. So the Spirit of God and the Word of God being these two parents-like in our spiritual birth. Our new birth brings us a new nature and a living hope. A new nature and a living hope. The Spirit gives us a new nature, and the Word gives us a living hope. It is God's Word where we learn about Jesus. It's where we read about the Redeemer. It's where our living hope comes from. So His Spirit brings us in, and then we have a divine nature that can actually understand what God is calling us to do and the life he's calling us to live. And then we have a living hope in Jesus who's described to us in God's word. We've experienced the same birth together. That's why we are together in family. And just like Nicodemus, though, remember, if you read the story of Nicodemus, you can go back to John 3 and do it later. I, I actually just recently watched one of the best depictions of this conversation and this relationship between Jesus and Nicodemus I've ever seen. It's in a series called The Chosen. So if you've seen this, it's remarkable. You need to watch it. If you, if you watch the actual episode of Jesus on the rooftop interacting with Nicodemus and you don't get a tear in your eye, you're missing something. I'm, watch it again, okay? 
This relationship, this conversation that Jesus is having with Nicodemus, because Nicodemus is striving to understand what Jesus is talking about, and he just can't get it. He's, he's looking, Jesus is talking to him in parables. He's describing this new life to him. And Nicodemus is just, I am so caught up in all that I've always known. I can't see what you're saying. And Jesus uses this term about being born again, this new birth. And Nicodemus says, hold on a second. What are you talking about? I can't go back into my mother's womb and be born again. And Jesus tells him, no, born of the spirit. It's this new birth that brings us into a new family. And here's the thing about family. With family comes particular expectations, right? There are expectations involved in a family unit. There's expectations that you will support each other. There's expectations that you will love each other. There's expectations, not that you'll always agree, but that you'll always have each other's back. And that you will respect your parents. See, all these expectations, our earthly families, our biological units that God gives us in this world, they teach us about him. God sovereignly uses everything we live in to show us his glory. And as he calls us into this new family through new birth, We're called to do those particular good and God-glorifying traits and examples in our new family, the family of God. We are called to love each other. We're called to support each other. We're called to have each other's backs. We're also called to respect and honor our Heavenly Father and His Word. See, the family of God, I'm convinced that too often as believers, we use terms like family of God or church and church family, and we don't actually dig into what that requires of us. That requires something of us. How do you respond to siblings? Well, maybe not how do you respond. How should you respond to siblings when you disagree when you have different points of view and you're trying to get your point across and how should you respond to siblings? It's okay to share your differences with each other and then respect each other and love each other. That's what God calls us to do in his family. If we're gonna be part of the family of God and glorify him and bring him honor and glory in the way that he's called us to, part of the holy living that we've talked about the last couple weeks is the fact that we treat each other the way that he has called us to and with the example that he's given us. Let's talk about what that could look like and should look like. He says here in verse 22, having purified your souls by obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. The word here, brotherly love, and, and we'll get into this in a minute. There are multiple terms for love used in Scripture, multiple different words that have multiple different meanings around the focus of that love. We have one word, love. The English, lam- the English language is slightly restrictive. See, when Scripture says love, he's not always talking about the same kind of love. What he's talking about here is brotherly love, or sisterly love, sibling love. What does that look like in the family of God? It needs to be first sincere. As our new birth brings divine nature and a living hope, we need to rely on him to give us the family that we've always looked for. See, experiencing the same birth and being in the same family means that we should be unified. In all of mankind's fleshly and earthly endeavors to try to be unified around anything never work. Just, we need to know that. I know there's a lot of more newer, modern, even current ways that we're trying to unify the world. It's never going to work. There's one way to unify people. 
and that's through Jesus. It's the only thing that works. From the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11, all the way to Revelation 17 and the great Babylon, man's great attempts to unify always fall short. See, in the flesh, without new birth in the spirit, unity doesn't stick. It might last for a little while, because what's the analogy that gets used here, right? Grass or a flower. Flowers are beautiful. For how long? Till they're not. Right? I mean, it's like, it, it, there's this concept, flowers are awesome, and you look at them and you're like, oh my word, they're gorgeous. And three days later, they look horrible and you throw them away. This is how the analogy is driven here. All of our earthly man-made endeavors to try to be unified and do something together as mankind are going to fail if they are not based upon Jesus. It's the only thing that'll move anything forward with any lasting hope. How do we pursue this unity? We have the same Holy Spirit. We call on the same Father. We share in the same divine nature. We trust in the same word of God. And therefore, we can be unified together as God's family. Because we have the same spirit, we call on the same Father, we have a divine nature, and we trust in the same word of God. That's where unity comes from. Here is the thing that needs to be reflected in the world from the church. You want to be a culture-changing person? You want to be part of something that's going to bring peace and unity and reconciliation to our world? This is it. This is it. Too often the church doesn't look like this. Too often our differences divide us, right? And our preferences fracture us. And we decide we're going to go do something else because I can't get along with all these Christians. Are you kidding me? If you can't get along with the Christians that God's put you in family with, you're not getting along with anybody else either. You're not going to go find some other perfect scenario. The old saying, right, that I've been hearing since I was a child, right? If you find a perfect church, don't join it. You'll ruin it. Okay? There, the reality is there's no perfect church. Okay? I'm sorry for all you visitors, but we love you. We want you here, and we'll work towards unity. But there is no perfect church, but there are churches and should be family, the family of God striving towards unity, working at it. See, unity is one of those things. It doesn't just happen because you hope it does. It happens because you put in what you want to get out of it. Sacrifice, love, grace, humility, forgiveness, repentance. These are the things that build unity in the church of God. The church should be the most unified place in the entire world. But that's not what you read about most of the time, is it, in regard to the church? But because we have the same birth, we're part of the same family, we should be more unified than any group anywhere. Does it mean we're the same? No. It's unity and diversity. We're going to be diverse. The body has lots of different gifts through lots of different members, all with the same purpose. One purpose. This is the only way to experience unity is to understand your new life in Christ. So the next time you feel like you want to splinter away or fracture away from another believer, just stop and realize, just for a moment, I hope some of these words from Scripture come back to you, and you stop and realize Christ endured way more than I'm having to endure right now in order for me to be unified with my brother or sister in Christ. Whatever I think I'm going through, whatever I think is big enough or important enough for me to push them away and go do my own thing, Christ endured more than you so that you wouldn't have to do that. This is the outworking of the gospel. This is why Peter gets to this point in verse 22. 
because everything he's been talking about, our great salvation in Christ, all the new life he's given us, the holiness that he's called us to live in should result in sincere brotherly love. And I like the fact that the word sincere is here because he doesn't want you to be fake about it. You've probably had experiences like this in life where people act like they really like you, but you're not totally sure they do. Or like words are just overwhelming and they're talking about their great affection for you, but their actions don't match up with it. That's insincerity. This is different. This is sincere brotherly love, genuine, the real thing. That's the kind of love that we're supposed to have for each other. He goes in here, a sincere brotherly love. The word there is literally Philadelphian. Right? I, I spent 25 years living in Philadelphia, and it's called the city of brotherly love. It's not really. Okay? I mean, there's a few, there's, there's people there that I do genuinely love. And there's some brotherly love, but... If you've spent a lot of time in Philadelphia, you would realize it's actually probably not the outworking of its own name. Why? Because human endeavors to live out something that you can only do with God's help, the human endeavors never get there. Only with God's help do you get there. Let's look at these. The second thing that exemplifies our togetherness in God's family. First, we've experienced the same birth. Secondly, we share the same love. Here's the thing with this term love. If a word means everything, it means nothing. And love itself, the word, is used so flippantly in so many ways in our world today that it actually does not mean anything. So in order for a word to mean something, you have to define it. So in order for love to mean something to us, we're called to love. It says right here, in order for us to know what that is, we have to know what that means. There's an idea that floats around in our culture, and it's, it's not accurate. It is not honoring to the Lord. It's this idea of love is love. So whatever you think love is, you get to be that. Well, that's because we're trying to define it. And if we're trying to define it, we're going to get roughly a few billion different ideas. But if God, the creator of love, and then our greatest example of love in Christ is the one who defines it, then we can know what that term means. We only know love because our Heavenly Father has shown it to us. It is the only true definition of love that you'll ever find is God's relationship to you and me. He has done everything to get to us. He has sacrificed his own son in order to be reunited and redeemed with us. He has literally, quite literally, moved heaven and earth to serve and love us. That's the definition of love. It's funny when you talk to people sometimes and they talk about love, and I think of this uh, term from a movie I love. It's called The Princess Bride, this old movie. We've talked about movies. I used the movie last week. Um, movie this week, Princess Bride, all right? I'm not talking, I'm not preaching on a movie, but... There's a term in there, there's this one interaction in there, and this guy keeps using a term, and the Sicilian looks at the other guy, he says, I do not think that, no, it's not the Sicilian, it's the other guy. He says, I do not think that means what you think that means. Because he keeps using the word inconceivable, okay? And, and while he uses the word inconceivable, he then talks about how it can be conceived, and you're like, no, that's not actually what it means. So he's misusing the term all the time. And the response is, I do not think that means what you think that means. And when I hear the word love used so flippantly in our world today, that, that quote just keeps coming into my head. I'm like, I don't think that means what you think that means. You want to love that person? That means you're going to lay your life down for them. Ready to do that? Because that's the actual definition. 
And I'm pretty confident we're not willing to lay our lives down for every single person we've ever met. Now, should we be? That's what God calls us to. But let's not flippantly throw words around if we're not willing to live up to them. Are you willing to lay your life down for the person sitting next to you? For the person down the pew from you? As brothers and sisters in Christ, would you sacrifice the way that God has in love? That's the mark we're called to. We only know love because our Heavenly Father has shown it to us. And we only truly love others because he has miraculously changed us. Because without that, our love will not be sincere brotherly love. It will be temporary and maybe flippant. And it will go away. This first word for love used here is an actual sentiment. Sincere brotherly love. Because for siblings, you feel something. And he's calling that feeling to be sincere and genuine. Now, there's a second word for love used here. He then goes on and says, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. The second word for love is agape. It's a different term. He wants us to be emotionally connected and have sincerity for each other in love. That's one. And then agape, he wants us to be committed to each other and principled. That's what this second term means. Principled and determined. So those are two different things. They're both love. So one of the wonderful things just about this one sentence is he wants us to love each other when we feel like it and when we don't. He wants us to love each other when we feel like it and when we're called to, even when we don't feel like it. Love one another, there's another term here, sincere was the one before the Philadelphia love. Now, earnestly is in the second part, from a pure heart. What does earnestly mean? Another translation uses the word fervently. See, the second one, the first one is, have a sincerity of feeling and emotion towards each other, where you genuinely care about each other. The second part is, work at it. Put in the time. When you don't feel like it, tell yourself you're doing it anyway. Build in habits in your life that reflect fervent love. Real love that you work at. These two types of love, brotherly love and sacrificial love, are how the people of God and the family of God should be defined. We have a third call here that in these last few verses that describe to us the togetherness in the family of God. First, it talks about the fact that we have experienced the same birth. Secondly, it talks about the fact that we share the same love. And then thirdly here, it talks about the fact that we have the same eternal word of God. You don't need anything more than these three things to realize that you should be unified inside of God's family. our new birth, our new life, the love that he's called us to, both sentimental and genuine love and also dedicated and principled love. And now here, we have the same eternal word of God. Look at the end of verse 23 with me. Actually, the beginning of verse 23. Since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, so not just you've been biologically born in the flesh, but because that goes away, right? This body will not live forever. I know, that's hard to believe, but no, it won't, and neither will yours. Death will come to all of us at some point unless Jesus returns first. But these earthly bodies are perishable. They're going away. That's not the kind of birth that he's talking about here. You have been born Again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed, okay? The imperishable is the word of God. You have been born anew through his spirit and through his word. And that never goes away. It's imperishable. It's permanent. It's eternal. 
He says, having been born of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. And he goes back and he quotes, because Peter and Paul do this so well in their writings, they want to incorporate the Old Testament scriptures into their current teaching. Because the word of God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he pulls in an Old Testament quote, he says, all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Have you ever looked at a beautiful flower and thought, that is awesome. They're gorgeous. I was out walking the other day, I'm walking my dog, and things are in bloom, or they were in bloom more a couple weeks ago, but when things are in bloom, you're walking, you're like, I just can't believe all the colors God's created. All the uniqueness and creativity. And I remember walking and thinking to myself, wow, this is pretty, pretty amazing that God gives us all this to enjoy. And I remember that thought in my head. And while I was studying, we were working my way through this passage, I thought, do I view God's word and his grace that way? Am I amazed by it? Because if I'm not, I'm not looking clearly enough. Because his imperishable word is so far beyond any perishable grass or flower that we look at regularly. So that hopefully next time you look at a beautiful, and I'm not saying don't enjoy God's creation. Please enjoy God's creation. And every time you enjoy God's creation, remark at how much better God is than just his creation. Enjoy it. But enjoy him more. Look to him more. Because he has given us his imperishable word. And lastly, at the end of verse 25, and this word, the imperishable word of God that lasts forever, that never goes away, this word is the good news that was preached to you. We have the same eternal word of God, which unifies us together. We're called to faithfully love it, to be in it, to be learning it, and to allow it to change our lives so that we can be unified together as the people of God. That's the only way that unity actually works. The way that God designed and created it to. Our inheritance is not perishable. Back in verse 4, it talks about that. Our faith is not perishable. Back in verse 7, it talks about our faith being imperishable. Our ransom is not perishable. In verse 18 and 19 of chapter 1. And now in verse 23 through 25, God's word is imperishable. This is what God does. God does things that last. All the things we do have a shelf life. But his don't. He works. Our inheritance, our faith, our ransom in him and his word, all imperishable, all just in this one chapter. So allow yourself to kind of be overwhelmed with the fact that God does greater, bigger things than anything we could ever do on our own. And particularly here, the call to live a holy life is the call to live with brotherly love and to live with sacrificial love towards those that God has brought you into family to be with. A couple of questions as we close today to help take God's word with us, to bury it deep in our hearts and hopefully change the way that we live. Has your new life in Christ resulted in this brotherly and sacrificial love for your brothers and sisters. Has it? Or is there something you need to repent of and change? And to ask the Lord to move your heart so that you can live with brotherly and sacrificial love for those around you? Is there someone that you have decided that you can be more critical towards in the family of God? Is there somebody who's different than you that you've lacked grace for in the family of God? That's where this kind of love applies. Ask the Lord to move your hearts and your sentiment and your emotion towards that person in brotherly love. And until you have that, dedicate yourself to be principled and to be dedicated to loving them. That's the kind of stuff that'll change the world around us. That's the kind of stuff the outside world looks in on and says, how are all those people who are all really different, all really together? That's where you get opportunities to share the gospel more. 
when you follow what God's called us to. Secondly, the question that I would encourage you with today, does the eternal word of God have impact on your life? And does it have the impact that it should? Is it a great enough impact that you long to look at it, that you long to be in it, that you know that God changes you through it? Does the eternal word of God have the impact on your life that it truly should? If we examine those two things for us together as a church family, I'm convinced of this. God will change our hearts. He will unify us together. And as we continue to grow in him and live the lives he's called us to live, he will give us more opportunities to share the good news with others than we would ever ask for. Simply because we're following the way that he's called us to live. 